Okay, it's uh, my turn to introduce the chair of the next session. Uh, Silvio Antonio Capes holds PhD in Development Economics by the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. His main areas of research are stock flow consistent models, institutional economics, income distribution, and monetary policy. His work has been published in a number of, of peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics and the Brazilian Keynesian Review. He is a co-editor of the El Elgar series on central banking and monetary theory, together with Louis Philippe Rochon and uh, Guillaume Vallet. He is also a coordinator of the Keynesian Economics Working Group of the Young Scholar Initiative of the Institute for the New Economic Thinking. Uh, Dr. Capel, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. And before we start, I would like to make a few remarks that you are possibly used to, given the last in introduction. So please remain muted and wait until the end to ask questions. The session is to have 90 minutes. And after the presentation, I will collect questions, provided we have time, because the next talk will begin at the scheduled time. And I will now introduce the speakers and then pass over to them. So Peter Chrysler studied at the University of Sydney and at Cambridge University and taught at the School of Economics at the University of New South Wales. He is on the editorial board of a number of journals, including the Cambridge Journal of Economics, the Journal of post Canadian Economics and the Economic and Labor Relations Review. And he's also editor of book series for Routledge and also Palgrave Macmillan. And the second presenter, Joseph Halevi, was born in Haifa, then in British Palestine, now in Israel, on 6th of November, 1946. He studied at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and taught at the New School for Social Research in New York, and at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and then at the University of Sydney, from which he retired in 2016. He was visiting professor at various universities, such as La Sapienza in Rome, the University of Connecticut, and the University of, Universities of Grenoble, Nice, and Picardy. And since 2010, he has been a professor at the International University College in Turing. So let us then start with Professor Peter Chrysler. Professor, please, the stage is yours. And I don't know who is the real Peter Chrysler, because there were two with Peter Chrysler's behind, so the, the, the correct one, please, you can start. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, well started. <laughs> I'm the real Peter Chrysler, so good day, everyone. <laughs> and first of all, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Louis Philippe and the members of the Lipinski Institute for organizing this conference. Uh, I think Kaleski is one of the most underrated uh, economists of the last century, and I think his contributions are, are fundamental. Um, and what Joseph and I are looking at today is the question of to what degree was Kaleski a Marxist. And in some ways, what we're doing in this paper is providing a sequel to a paper that we published in Ro uh, of about 30 years ago, showing my age now, uh, which was called Kaleski Classical Economics and the Surplus Approach. And in that paper, we examined Kaleski's work and located it within the classical surplus approach. So what we're doing in the paper we're presenting today is extending the analysis to argue that Kaleski's work should be located within the Marxian approach. And to people who are familiar with Kaleski's background and his work, this should come as no surprise. His introduction to economics was through the works of Rosa Luxemburg and Tukin Baranowski, and his subsequent interest in Marxian theory permeates a lot of his work. And it's not surprising that these writers have exerted an important influence on him. That this influence and their influence never left him is apparent throughout his career and in his explicit discussion, both of the works of Rosa and Tugan, but also of the works of Marx, which we'll be discussing. And so what we argue is that his work should be regarded as contributing very substantially to the Marxist legacy. So I guess an important thing to ask at the very beginning is why even ask this question? And we think it's important to argue this position because the Marxian aspect of Kaleski's analysis is not universally recognized though there are some very, very good works of comparison, and one that comes to mind and is relevant uh, 
to this conference is Malcolm Sawyer in the Economics of Mikhail Kaliski has an excellent chapter comparing Kaliski and Marx. However, it's not universally true. And something that particularly influenced me was a very influential two volume work by um, Mike Howard and John King called The History of Marx in Economics from 1929 to 1990. And what they attempted to do there and what many economists believe they did do was provide a definite history of Marx in economics covering the major contribution, contributors and contributions. But what's really important to note is that in that volume, Marx's contributions are not considered as part of this uh, Marxian contribution. And when they do discuss Kaliski, they label his work as post-Keynesian. And as a result of that, we think that that leads to some important problems in the book and in the book's version of Marx. And let me give you some examples. I'm going to try and share the screen here. So wish me luck. Okay. Okay, does that come out? Yes. Okay, so this is a, a quote from, from them. They say that, um, you know, they claim that despite the fact that Marxian economists were better equipped than mainstream economists to deal with crisis theory, it was from the ranks of the latter that the most notable intellectual development occurred, namely Keynes's general theory. Whereas what we would like to argue is that in fact, just as significant uh, a contribution came from Marxist theory, particularly in the work of Kaleski. Okay, so. And when we look at the rest of the, the book, uh, you know, that they criticize, a lot of their criticisms of Marxist theory, and they are quite critical of it, are only valid if you exclude Kaliski from the Marxist school. So they have a section on Marxist on Keynes in which they discuss reactions to and reviews the general theory, and they totally ignore Kaliski's very important fundamental review, which although it was pub originally published in Polish, had been translated and published in English in 1982 uh, in Australian Economic Papers. And I know Jeff Harcourt, who was editor of Australian Economic Papers, regards that particular paper as his most important contribution uh, through the journal. Similarly, um, the important contribution of Kaleski to crisis theory, to his independent discovery of many uh, of the important aspects of Keynesian ideas are neglected. And this is quite interesting because in a number of cases, places, they very clearly state that Kaliski is a post-Keynesian economist, and they compare him to Baran and Sweezy, who they both regard as Marxist economists. And they do admit that a Kaliskian reformation of Marxian analysis affected demand is a possible basis of the integration of Marx and Keynes, but that's Kaliski as a Keynesian rather than as a Marxist. They argue that Baron and Sweezy's work on monopoly capital is a fundamental development of Marxian theory, yet they ignore the fact that Baron and Sweezy, if you read Monopoly Capital, have a very handsome acknowledgement to the great debt they owe to Kaleski and to Kaleski's work. They have a chapter on monopoly capital, uh, and they don't mention Kaleski at all, despite his pioneering work, and despite the fact that many of the economists and the Marxists that they do discuss a building on Kaleski's contribution, and they dismiss Kaleski as a European alternate approach. They have chapters on the permanent arms race, which make no mention of Kaleski's work in this area, particularly his very important posthumous paper, uh, which he wrote with Kowalik, Observations on the Crucial Fall. There's a whole analysis on development where they criticize Marxists for not thinking deeply enough about it. Again, no mention of Kaleski's su substantial contributions. And there's a chapter on the political economy of socialism, and despite Kaleski's significant contribution to these areas, he's hardly mentioned at all. And this is in contrast with the work of what we consider some of the greater Marxist economists of the second half of the 20th century, and then uh, people like Baran, Suisse, and Dobb, who all acknowledge Kaleski's Marxism, as well as his importance to the contributions to Marxist economic theory. Now, I think uh, in the earlier section, uh, there was a question raised by Paul on uh, Kaleski's view on the labor theory of value. And I think the best sort of summary of that is provided by Morris Dobb. And again, if I can share the screen. Um, here. Okay. 
Okay, so what Dobbs said is that what one, one might say that while the classic Marxian explanation for the emergence of surplus value continues to apply to modern capitalism, as to its earliest stages, the influence of monopoly enters in an additive element in the stage of monopoly capitalism. So Dobbs explicitly goes on to discuss the fact that the rules of the distribution of surplus change under monopoly capitalism and that Kaleski's analysis of pricing gives us the best guide to those rules. And this comes to a point that we'll, we'll be talking about later on, and that is the change in the nature of capitalism, which explains some of the fundamental differences between Kaleski and Marx. But what, we're what we argue in the paper is that the underlying methods of both Marx and Kaleski, their vision of society and its dynamics, and much of their analysis are fundamentally the same. And the differences arise due to the development of capitalism. In other words, capitalism is at a different stage of its development when Kaleski's writing to when Marx is writing, and that explains a lot of their difference in theory. And both Marx and Kaleski see the importance of historical development of economic forces as shaping society and the economy. As a result, the changes in capitalism as it develops and evolves mean that both of them were looking at different stages of that development. The factors determining output growth and employment at the stage of development of capitalism when Kaleski were writing are different to the factors which determine these in Marx's time. And Kaleski acknowledges the fundamental changes as a result of the development of capitalism. Uh, and he sees that as tied into historical materialism. And his most explicit discussion, he actually discusses uh, historical materialism in a very interesting paper called Econometric Model and Historical Materialism. And here he has a very clear statement of Marx's method embodied in the materialist view of society. And then he outlines its implication for economics and econometrics. And according to Kaliski, uh, historical materialism means that the process of development of society is by the productive forces and productive relations which influence the other social phenomena such as government, culture, science and technology, etc., with important feedbacks. And as long as productive relations and the availability of natural resources remain unchanged, then importantly, he argues, the economy isn't going to be subject to structural change. And so economic and econometric models, uh, economics and econometrics can model society in terms of functional relations. So he sort of discovered the Lucas critique of structural change way before Lucas. But the important thing is that Kaleski's analysis of historical materialism stresses the interplay of continuity in economic relations that are interrupted by discontinuity brought around by changes in productive relations. And these structural change brings with it new social institutions. And very importantly for Kaleski, the institutional framework of a social system is a basic element of its economic dynamics. In other words, as economic society changes, so do the basic elements of economic dynamics. So Kaleski and Marx both share a view as to why economies change. And as a result, different economic systems require different economic analysis though their general method remains the same. And I must say, this is something I always stress to students, that unlike neoclassical theory, which has the same theory to explain everything, so you can use neoclassical theory to explain feudal society, developing economies, socialist economies, slave economies, capitalist economies, what Kaleski stresses is because of the fundamental differences in institutions, you need different theoretical frameworks for each. And he often stresses the fact that capitalism has developed since Marx's time, and that requires additional analysis. And in particular, the level of capital accumulation that has resulted in modern capitalism and its concurrent advancement of large corporations leading to increased concentration and monopolization has led to profound changes to the dynamics of employment and growth. And in particular, this has changed the nature of many important economic relations and had important implications for the nature of the realization problem and the determination of prices. So according to Kaleski, capitalist economies have reached a stage of capital accumulation where the existing capital stock is sufficient to employ all the economy's labor force. 
And associated with this is the rise of very large, imperfectly competitive firms. So the economic dynamics of capitalism have evolved, and as a result, growth and employment are determined by different factors than they were during Marx's time. So under monopoly capitalism for both Keynes and Kolesky, the major problem with capitalist economies is the underutilization of capital resulting from insufficient effective demand. And we know the solution is to increase effective demand via some sort of exogenous force, exogenous means, such as government expenditure, exports, stimulating investment. But importantly, he contrasts that with the early stages of capitalist society development, which haven't reached that stage of capital accumulation. In the early stages of capital, capitalist development, which he argues is what Marx was describing, the capital stock is not sufficient to employ all the labor force. In other words, even when there's no excess capacity, there's not enough capital to fully employ labor. So the crucial problem is the shortage of productive capacity. And again, if I can quote Koleski on this, He says, the crucial problem in the underdeveloped economy is different from that of the developed economy. The crucial problem facing undeveloped economy is thus to increase investment considerably, not for the sake of generating effective demand, which is why we need to increase investment in developed economies, but the, for the sake of accelerating the expansion of productive capacity indispensable for the rapid growth of national income. So again, what he's arguing here is that there's a fundamental difference in the dynamics of what determines uh, output and employment between this early stage where there's insufficient capital to fully employ the labor force. And so what we need is investment and in the later stages. In the later stages of capitalism, we know that Kolesky talked about investment as a double-edged sword. In the short run, it's vital because we need increased investment to increase effective demand and that's important in reducing today's unemployment but at the same time this increases capacity increases productivity which increases tomorrow's unemployment and there's a, a wonderful quote from Koleski where people say look people he said people think the theory is paradoxical but it's not the theory it's capitalism in contrast, in developed economies, there's insufficient effective demand. That isn't so much the problem. The problem is simply that we need to increase capital stock, and so investment is unambiguously positive. So associated with the changing role of effective demand is the changing nature of competition in capitalist economies. Under early or what is sometimes called competitive stage of capitalist society of capitalism, Competition drives firms to invest all their surplus. And we have Marx's well-known aphorism, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. The competitive impetus means that all the surplus must be invested or firms will lose out in the competitive struggle. And this becomes very important because when Marx talks about the realization problem, it's different to when Keynes and Kolesky talk about um, effective demand again, because of this fundamental difference in the nature of capitalism. So for Marx, because the nature of competition means that all investment has to be, all, all profits have to be invested, investment is not the problem. The problem with realization is under consumption. But as capitalism enters its monopoly stage, the nature of competition changes. Firms have significant market powers and there's no longer the same incentive to invest. And this leads both to the challenges associated with the market pricing, but also problems with effective demand, where the problem is not so much under consumption, but rather insufficient investment. So to emphasize what I'm saying is the differences in analysis in, between Kolesky and Keynes represent changes in capitalism. They're each describing different stages in the development of society, even though their methods are fundamentally similar. Okay, at this stage, I'm gonna leave it to Joseph, who's now gonna talk about their similarities, where I've spoken about the reasons for their theoretical differences, despite the similarity in method. Joseph. Okay, thank you. So I am, I am the Joseph Chrysler. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay, I, I will, um, I'll start from the context 
uh, in which the early work of Galetsky appeared, was published, the, the intellectual background. So first you have to know that in, in, in uh, Germany and uh, Central Europe and then Russia, uh, Marxian economics was taken very seriously, not of course by every, but mostly outside academic, but very serious intellectual took it seriously. And, and, uh, in, and therefore it was considered to be uh, a, um, a, a scientific approach by many, uh, even by people who did not think of themselves necessarily Marxists, they may have, might have thought of themselves as socialists, like Tugan Baranovsky, who was not, he did not consider himself Marxist, although he contributed a lot to that. Now, um, and the other thing is that Marxian, Marxism and the, those who developed Marxian economic uh, analysis, they were, they were part of the socialist movement. Okay, so it, it was not an academic movement. It was not an academic strand. It was part of the socialist. It was the socialist movement, as a matter of fact, except for, except for, for Britain, which the labor movement never claimed to have any uh, specific relations to, to, Marx, to Marxism. And to some extent also the French socialist, uh, whatever they claimed, however, they were different uh, line of thought than, than, than the structured analysis of Marxism. Now, before First World War, what was what what were the main the main issues in Marxian political economy, in Marxian economics? They all stemmed from the experience of uh, of Germany, really, because the, the the focus moved away from England where Marx, which Marx took as a reference model, but to Germany because of the German uh, nature of capitalist accumulation. And so the issue was either whether, whether the system could grow, mostly could grow by sustaining itself through the accumulation in the capital goods sector, right? Or whether it was bound to, to, to collapse. That was one issue, okay? The other issue, and that was Tugan Baranovsky and also uh, Lenin to some extent, not so much because then he was, he, he was uh, focused on the issues of capitalist development in, 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 in Russia before writing his uh, political pamphlet and before being engaged in the revolution uh, and, and being, being the promoter of it. But, um, the, the other issue was uh, whether the system uh, could be thought of as uh, competitive or not, competitive in the Marxian sense, right? And generally speaking, the answer was not. And the person who gave that answer uh, of, of not being so was, uh, uh, was Hilferding, Rudolf Hilferding. Who developed the notion? The notion of finance capital is really a notion of trustified capitalism, German, really German type, and uh, where the system ends up being governed by cartels. And as against that, you have the position of not against the Hilferding notion of non-competitive capitalism, but against the notion that the the, the, the dialectics is between is between whether it can grow forever based on the capital goods sector or whether it can it will is bound to collapse against that you have rosa luxembourg and and rosa luxembourg she basically rejected this dichotomous approach and then she also uh, did not consider the system to be competitive in the classical sense in the marxian sense that's the the, the, the notion that they had so but, but, but she also identified the fundamental shortcoming in Marx's schemes of reproduction that she herself used, but in a different way. That is to say that she, 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 she realized, she understood that in Marx's schemes of reproduction, 
there is a specific, there are there is a condition whereby the surplus is always reinvested. And then she raised the issue that the surplus need not necessarily be invested, and therefore this surplus have to to struggle to find an outlet somewhere. And this outlet is provided institutionally through what? Through imperialism. One and also through military expenditure. This is the, these are the two things. So Kaleski falls entirely within this framework, okay? Because the first, if you, if he, he, he started publishing and writing, if you look at the collected works, uh, and this I discovered when I did not know that until 1992, when I, Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff, they asked me to review the first two volumes of uh, Kalecki's work edited by Orzhatinsky, and I discovered the articles that he published in the in the Socialist Review. It was a Polish, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the English translation of the journal, which was called Socialist Review in Poland. And one of his first articles in 1932 is a, a critique of the view that monopolized, trustified capitalism, as Schumpeter put it, was stable because Hilferding's view of finance capital was that cartels would clash and would generate even wars. But once this process is over, the cartels that remain in place, that, 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 that control the scene, they will eventually sort of form an entente and thereby whereby the system would be stable. And so also uh, the monetary circulation would be under the control of cartels and therefore it will be stable. There will not be financial crisis because that will be completely planned from within the cartel system. By the way, Schumpeter completely absorbed this view because in 1928, he wrote an article in the economic journal on trustified capitalism. And that is exactly that view that he put forward, which comes really from Hilferding. And Kalecki, in the 1932, in the 1932 article in the Socialist Review, he actually criticized that view. He simply split the economy in two parts. And one is a competitive sector, uh, which he considered to be the consumption good sector at the time. And uh, and and the, the monopolistic sector is the capital good. I mean, steel and these were the oligopolistic companies then. Okay, steel, aluminium, the big uh, metal producers. And then he showed that uh, uh, the, the uh, under these circumstances, uh, the all the trustified economy, which is a dual economy in that respect, is less is less stable than the classical competitive than the competitive system. That's what he showed. So it, it completely falls within this kind of, uh, this kind of, of argument. And, and, and the important point, the, really the, the, big in, the big difference, much bigger, a more significant and actually prior to Keynes is the explicit introduction of unused capacity, excess capacity. In Keynes, you have excess unused labor, but excess capacity does not appear uh, analytically. Whereas in the case of Kaletsky, it appears unused capacity. It appears the buildup of excess capacity, okay? Which has a micro aspect and the macro aspect at the same time. That's the big innovation that he introduces in Marxian analysis, in a, in, where the categories are entirely Marxist. The, the, the macroeconomic categories are not general income, general level of employment, and this. They are profits, what determines profits, how income distribution connects to, to this factor through the oligopolistic formation, through the markup and everything that we know now analytically, there are so many little models of that that we don't have to expand. And that is the introduction. It's very important because th there wasn't such a thing before. Certainly, there was not such a thing in Marxian analysis, except in one case, which I did not mention in the piece that, that we wrote with uh, Peter Chrysler, uh, simply because I forgot to mention it, is that there was one person of the Soviet, of the Bolshevik party, of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, that wrote a, a, a book, which is called, 
the end of the final end, the final crisis, the final zakat kapitalism, the end of capitalism. And that guy was Probraszynski. But the book was not known because it was never published. Then Probraszynski was, was basically uh, was killed by Stalin. So he, he uh, Probraszynski introduced a system he called this under monopoly, he took from Lenin, monopolistic capitalism, under monopoly capitalism, there is a thrombosis in the process of reproduction because of monopolistic prices, okay? They, they called it thrombosis. But it, it is messy. I read the book because it was published by in, in the United States in the, mid, in, in the mid 80s. It's a very, it's a very cumbersome book because it uses labor values, etc. But it's the only one, but that was unknown because it was discovered, it was in some Moscow uh, uh, office, library, whatever, and, and it was discovered by this American researcher. It was not known before. But by and large, in Martian thought, there was no notion of unused capacity because it was simply based on classical economics, on the, on the economics of Marx, that in that respect is classical. So this is the very big importance of, of significant importance, analytical importance of 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 Kalecki. This is one point I want to make, and then I won't elab elaborate any further. Say an, a, another thing. Secondly, we have to think of the the way the Weltanschauung of of Kalecki, as it as it manifests itself through the decades in which he lived. I mean, the, in my view, my personal view is that. Kalecki is one, is perhaps the most important economist of the 20th century. Most important. Why? Because if you look at his work, he covers the three systems that manifested it themselves throughout the 20th century. Okay? So he covered the capitalist system in its different stages, first in the 1930s and then in the 1950s, and it's not the same. In the 1950s, he identified the uh, element of stability in the capital system, a stability which he did not like, and in fact, he criticized in the paper with Kovali. But, so he covered the capitalist system. He covered, I mean, he covered, he was a, a major theoretician of planning, of socialist planning. Socialist planning, he identified with the ability to, uh, first of all, to fix prices, to, the central planning. He identified, and not necessarily completely to fix prices, but certainly to fix the level of investment and to determine, and to determine the planning centrally. That's definitely. And, and, and the other element that he, um, that he covered, that that's very important, he covered mm -hmm. the developing economies. And, he, and he, he covered the developing economies, not just in terms of development purpose, but development in a particular way. And he did not consider the possibility for developing economies to, to, to substantially to develop quantitatively they may, I mean, but in terms of, of, of the social development without a form of transitional regime, of intermediate regime, okay? And this idea of intermediate regime is an idea that developed out of a strong convergence that existed and then was killed between Nehru, Sukarno in Indonesia, Sukarno in Indonesia, and uh, Tito and, and, and Chuen Lai that led to the Bandung Conference, which is the beginning of the movement of the non-allied nation. Then it all got killed first because of the clash between, between, India, uh, between China and India, and then between China and the Soviet Union, and it got, got all killed. But what I'm saying is this notion of development is an, an intermediate stage uh, uh, development, not fully, not non-capitalistic development, but neither a, a, a definite socialist um, communist-led development, uh, this notion of, inter, notion of intermediate regime is very central in Kalecki, and he actually analyzed also the contradictions of that, okay? So in terms of his historical understanding 
in, in real time, it, it, it's completely within the framework of historical, of historical materialism, I think. And therefore, I, I, this, this is, these are my, my point here, and I will not um, add much more, and I leave the rest to discussion. Okay. I finished. We can have a debate if you want. Okay, thank you. I hope you can you can hear me because Zoom is saying that my connection is unstable. No, can my Zoom. Okay, thank you. Very good. Peter, do do you want to comment further on Joseph? No. Not really. I mean, in the in the paper, though, we didn't have time to discuss it today. We look at a whole number of factors, you know, such as the role of the reserve army and the unemployed, which Jersey talked about earlier. Um, we looked at the role of trade unions, labour movements, class struggle, uh, political aspects of full employment. All of these as concrete examples of Kaleski's Marxism. But as I said, it, in the time we had, it was more the sort of broad brush that we tried to cover. Okay, so let's now turn to questions. I see Robert Robert Blecker here. Do you want to ask a question, Robert? Well, first of all, did I fix my audio problem, my speaker? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. I've been working on the technology uh, during this uh, time. It's very important for tomorrow morning. Thank you for that really stimulating uh, presentation. Um, I'm actually going to ask the same question I was going to ask in the previous session, but I think it's quite relevant here. And it was stimulated by also the question of uh, Paul Zaremka in that session uh, in terms of analogies between Kaletsky and, and Marx. So we know, of course, that Kaletsky did not use the labor value categories uh, from, from Marx. Um, and uh, Yersi uh, confirmed that that was not central to Kaletsky's thinking. Uh, but when I learned about Kaletsky, I, I remember hearing that there was an analogy between his use of the markup rate as the key factor that determines income distribution and thereby affects capital accumulation and the rate of exploitation in Marx. That even though they're conceptualized differently, this is a key rate that is the, the central determinant of, of income distribution with the difference that I think you, you explained very well, that Kaletsky is talking about an oligopolistic or monopolistic system in which the market rate is related to the degree of monopoly. Um, uh, but you know, when Kaletsky talks about the class struggle, for example, in his posthumous 1971 paper, the, the, the workers, and this is like Keynes, can only bargain over the nominal wage, and that will be able to affect the uh, real wage and the wage share and the income distribution only if it reduces the markup. So uh, do you see this analogy between the markup rate in Kaletsky and the rate of exploitation of Marx, or is that just something I'm misremembering from my early training? Uh, Peter, do you want to answer first? Yeah, okay. In that 71 paper, he talks about the markup being determined by two struggles. One is the struggle within capitalists, uh, between capitalists themselves. And the second is the struggle between labor and capital. So I think to the extent that it's the struggle between labor and capital, yes, it does represent exploitation. Um, but I think for Marx, for Kaleski, what's more important in, ex in the question of exploitation is the reserve army. And, you know, like Marx, Kaleski believes that capitalism needs unemployment um, and that unemployment is not an accidental byproduct, but it's necessary. And as he points out, you know, after him and Keynes, we know we, we, we don't need unemployment. We can get rid of it, but capitalists will push for unemployment because of the important function it serves in capitalism. Now, interestingly, uh, and this is something we discussed in the paper, that the function is different to in Marx. In Marx, the main function of unemployment is to reduce wages. In Kaleski, it's more to do with discipline of workers, power of workers, and productivity. So it's affecting exploitation through its impact on productivity and so on. So I do think that the markup is part of the story, 
but I also think that unemployment and the, the necessary creation and the capitalism of, of unemployment is the other part of the story. Joseph, do you want to yeah. add anything? No, just to say that in the 71 paper is actually a kind of blueprint or suggestions of how to break the rules of the game. That's where 71 paper can be connected to the uh, other paper with Kovalik, as a matter of fact. The Kovalik is more, more political, historical and political, because what he argues is that in the Kovalik paper, which is also posthumously pu published, um, he argues that the, the working class sort of settled. He looks at the United States, really. The working class settled in a situation in which wages grow with, with productivity and, and, and full employment is, is, is guaranteed, is guaranteed, is maintained through military expenditure because in those years he became very concerned with the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera. This is also a paper that was published by Monthly Review Press. Uh, uh, on, 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 on Vietnam and big business in the United States, etc. Um, so he tried to, to look at conditions that can break the rules of the game. And what are also the, the logical factors that can, on, on which uh, to hang. So the paper, the 71 paper says basically to the trade unions, do not accept that there is an inverse relations between the level of profit and wages. Don't accept that because it's not true. If investment is determined, if investment is that this will determine the level of profits, okay? So, and if in this context, there is a big increase in wages, uh, then what will happen is a change in the distribution of profits between consumption goods and capital goods. Capital goods and luxury goods will fall, the level of profits, whereas they will swell in the consumption goods sector because the non, the workers that do not work in the consumption goods sector, they will spend very increased wages in, the, in consumption goods. This can happen in monetary terms with price increases or in real terms. So in real terms, the unions have to be, or and he says political parties in the, um, in the parliament, I mean, labor parties, social democratic parties, etc., uh, they should uh, they should further uh, legislation that helps the unions to, uh, uh, to 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 avoid to fight any transfer onto prices of wage increases. That's what he. That's basically what he had. So it's a kind of economic type of class struggle. Okay. Uh, of, of breaking the rules of the game. Don't be afraid that uh, the um, uh, an increase in wages will reduce profit. Don't fall into that trap by, by, by bosses. And by the way, there is a very beautiful paper of long ago by Marc Lavoie and Mario Secareccia on that. I mean, they, they, they developed a very address to the Canadian unions. I, re I remember that. And, uh, but uh, I, I, I don't, I, I cannot find one in one of my boxes, so I cannot find, you know, by definition. <laughs> okay, thank you for the answers. Before I pass to, uh, I see Robert Robert Blacker. Do you have further questions, Robert? No? Okay. So before I pass to Amitava Dutt, who has a question, let me briefly explain how is the raise hand option in order to, to better organize the questions here, you can click on the participants icon in the menu below. And when you click there, there will open a list of all the participants here in the Zoom chat. And at the bottom of it, there is a raise hand button. If you click there, I will see your raised hand here. And I will pass the question to you. Just for you to know, I will now pass to Amitava Dutt. You he has a question, and then will be to Gabriel Zafari and Ilhan Dogus. So Amitava, please, your question. Um, <clears throat> thanks for getting to me. Um, um, it was a very interesting paper, um, looking at the connections between Marx and Marxists on one hand and Kalechki on the other. However, I, I want to ask the question, why write a paper like this in the following sense that uh, was Kalechki a Marxist? Uh, I think that um, 
Peter's uh, comment was that, well, it's not widely recognized as such. But my, my question is, who is a Marxist? Uh, second, uh, is that being uh, something that, that means that's what you are and nothing else? Uh, in, in other words, was Kalechki also, I wouldn't call it a Keynesian or post-Keynesian, was Kalechki also part of the aggregate demand perspective? So he could be part of many things. Um, I think that uh, despite your very interesting comments, uh, some discussion of what is a Marxist uh, and some debates about it, and in what sense Kalechki was and wasn't a Marxist, perhaps as reflected in the writing, and especially if he wasn't a Marxist, for example, I think somebody raised the question of labor theory of value uh, earlier. Uh, and was that a conscious choice of not following some parts of Marx while uh, following some others? Thank you. I think that the answer to the labor theory of value is that you can't have a labor theory of value of monopoly capitalism because the essence of the labor theory of value is a tendency to a uniform rate of profit undeniable. And if you don't have that, then I think there are fundamental problems. I think Kalesi acknowledged that, that there, there are different rules governing the creation of value and, you, and the labor theory of value is useful for that and the distribution of that value. And under monopoly capitalism, as Dobbs said, the rules are closer to the ones of Kolesky. But I think that there's no problem with saying he's a Marxist and he believes in aggregate demand for all the reasons we talked about. But our definition of Marxism is the fundamental method where with historical materialism, seeing the economy as dominating other relations in the economy, uh, as determining those relationships with feedbacks, but also seeing the importance of the development of the, and the evolution of the economy, uh, in analysing it in terms of class analysis, in terms of the categories that Marx is using, uh, focusing on accumulation, using the, the schemes of reproduction, which he uses all the time. All of these two, are, I think, are the essence of Marxism. And I think why it's important is because the central question, if, if you look at the, the, the King and Howard book, which I said influenced our thinking a lot, reading that Marxism is a dead end because a lot of the questions they ask, they, they argue that Marxists can't answer. But uh, what we're saying is that Marxism isn't a dead end, that it provides useful and important insights and they come from mainly well, a lot from the work of Kolesky and people who have de developed that work like Baran Sweezy, um, Magdoff, the Monthly Review School and so on. Just yeah, also because interest. the Howard and King book, two volumes, is is a sort of definitive uh, so far history of Marx and of Marx and economics, and 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 it would be important to to correct it. That's. Uh, mm. I mean, for example, they are, they argue that Marxists were not very good at analyzing developing economies, and yet if you look at the work of of Kolesky on development, I mean, it's very. Uh, profound and insightful. And the same with uh, analysing socialist economies and uh, you know, developments there. Again, um, you know, once you take Kolesky out of the equation, I think the evaluation of Marx in economics is diminished as well. So I do think that, there, that it is important to ask that question. Okay, thank you both. And Gabriel Zaffari now has a question. So Gabriel, please unmute yourself. And please don't forget to mute yourself again when you finish your question. So, Gabriel, hey. please. Um, um, hello, I'm Gabriel. And I want to ask, um, we're talking about um, Kalecki as a Marxist from a methodological point of view. And in Marx, um, there is a great um, weight to dialectics and the importance of Hegelian influence on his construction of economic analysis. And Marxism had after Marx, many Marxisms. So there was a positive Marxism in Austria and the Vienna Circle. Uh, there was also Marxism in that vein. Do you believe that when we say that Kalecki was a Marxist, uh, what type of Marxists are we talking about? Are we talking these types of Marxists? 
Um, because, you know, Marxism is a very um, prolific uh, field of thought. It's many <laughs> infinite um, different approaches. And in his uh, works that he cited about um, econometrics and material and historical materialism, there is a pre-dialectical thinking or something very close to that. But I want to hear about you both, what you think about um, which type of Marxist could we say like he was? Can I just, I said just two, two words. This is why I started by saying that one has to, to locate Kalecki historically. I mean, that's why I say we have to look what was the, the framework of, of uh, Marxian economic debates, discussion within the socialist movement. That's what mattered. That all what you said later and except with the with Adler and, and, and the Austrian school, but essentially uh, the also the Adler they were part of the of the socialist of the socialist movement and in, in the case of a great deal of Central Europe the issue was growth accumulation or breakdown and and then Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin brought brought in uh, in a, two different ways, uh, the, the question of of, uh, of imperialism, Rosa Luxemburg as a way to find an outlet for 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 the surplus, and in the case of Lenin, uh, as as um, in connection to monopoly capital, uh, as uh, uh, as a form of. Uh, it also can be connected with analytically the, the question of the surplus does not appear, but uh, as an expression of the of the tendency of uh, monopoly capital. Anyway, so that's that's uh, that's the and, and, and Kalecki comes from that frame is, is is in that framework. It's the framework of Rosa Luxemburg. Now, in in those discussions, uh, labor theory of value was not used as a was used as a general macroeconomic reference. It, there, were, there were not many debates. The only one who developed a debate discussion and tried to prove, to prove through the labor theory of value the, 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 the consistency of the falling rate of profit uh, in Marx, that was Heinrich uh, Grossman, right? But, but, but otherwise, that was considered to be the, the general macroeconomic, like you, you, you write Y equals C plus I, and you are not going to, to, to quibble too much about the, 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 the value system, the price structure underneath it's in there's some kind of monetary real terms, et cetera. Well, that's how the, the, the math schemes of reproduction were, were discussed. They were more, they were more uh, impressed by the, by the schemes, by the, the um, physical analytical dimension of, of, of the schemes and to discuss the rate of accumulation. Well, that's basically what, where Kaletsky come from, comes from. That is that kind of Marxism. Then all the many other Marxisms that that, that, that you mentioned, then they develop. Also, the, the 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 Frankfurt School contributed to that. They developed as quite heavy uh, academic uh, type of uh, of strands, which Kaletsky never participated in. Absolutely never participated in 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 those sort of things. Yeah, and if you look to Kaletsky's contribution to the one hundred. Uh, anniversary of uh, Das Kapital. Uh, uh, he sent a written contribution that uh, was published in the UNESCO journal, I think, or, uh, um, um, because he did not want to leave Poland because of the situation in Poland then. He did not want to leave Poland. So he, he sent a written contribution that's entirely on the question of uh, of accumulation and, 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 and whether accumulation is sustainable or not. And that's his contribution to the hunter's anniversary of the, the of the discussion of Das Kapital. So that that is the framework of Kaletsky. Um, let's see. Finish. Peter, will you comment further? No, I think Joseph. Okay, so Ilhan Dogos, you have a question. Uh, Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. My question is about the reserve, the concept of reserve army. It reminds me that as if capitalists come together 
in order to keep the unemployment level at a, uh, so to say, optimum level for them. But uh, I am skeptical about it because uh, I think if they need uh, some new workers to hire, then they will do it. And uh, uh, how would you explain this uh, process at an aggregate uh, process? Because uh, each new worker uh, or each new employment would uh, at aggregate finance itself and through their consumption and so on. Uh, but uh, if you think that, uh, yes, unemployment has a depressive, depressing effect on wages, okay. Uh, but if you think of that, uh, such reserve army is uh, desirable for capitalists, that reminds me that as if capitalists intentionally uh, keep people unemployed and despite they need new workers, they don't hire. Uh, that's why it's not, not convincing me. Thank you. No, but what you're talking about here is the difference between capitalists as individuals and capitalists as a class. And for capitalists as individuals, high levels of employment are important, but as a class, they see the necessity of, unemplo of, of unemployment. And in his political aspects of full employment paper, he very clearly shows the mechanisms by which capitalism, capitalists as a class try and reinforce uh, unemployment and, and try and generate unemployment by doing things like arguing for sound finance, by opposing government um, expenditure, uh, by doing all the sorts of things that we've seen the neoliberal regime been doing since the 1970s. Uh, you know, he even predicted the existence of Friedman. You know, there'll always be some economist who talks about the importance of sound finance. I mean, today, and from the 1930s, from the works of Kalesi and Keynes, we could have eliminated unemployment. There was no need for unemployment whatsoever in capitalist economies. And yet from the 1970s on, we've had high levels of unemployment. We've had stagnation precisely because of the impact of capitalists pushing governments to move away from any commitment to full employment. At the same time, they've been pushing them away from the welfare state, and we've had a dismantling of the welfare state, again, because of the impact of the welfare state on relative power of workers and capitalists. So it's exactly those mechanisms. It's not capitalists saying we're not going to employ somebody. It's capitalists pushing uh, governments into policies that will not get, uh, get rid of unemployment. And when we do have full, high levels of employment, saying, you know, you've got to worry about the size of the deficit. It's the deficit fetishism, the attempts to reduce government expenditure whenever we get near full employment that are a problem. And in most Western countries, uh, government policy is such that once unemployment gets below a certain level, they uh, start implementing strict uh, fiscal and monetary policy, contractual and fiscal and monetary policy, way before we get to what we would consider full employment for reasons that are vaguely to do with what they call inflation. But it's never been, it's never clear why that needs to be the case, except for the sort of reasons Koleski talks about in his 40 paper. Joseph, do you want to add anything? Or? No, I'm okay. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Another question by Mehdi Shongi, who raised the hand. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, and uh, thank you, Peter Chrysler, for your very interesting paper. I wanted just to um, emphasize in a very fine, uh, I don't know, and I'm asking also a question about this, whether uh, Kaletsky, because notoriously Rosa Luxemburg didn't like the famous falling tendency of the rate of profit. Uh, law, so-called law, and uh, then uh, uh, in the Frankfurt School, Henry Grossman took the line of uh, collapse of the capitalist regime on the basis of Rosa Luxemburg, but then con connected it to the falling rate of profit. But we know indirectly about Kaletsky that uh, he also didn't really like, in my view, the 
the falling rate of profit. And he, on the other hand, like Rosa Luxemburg emphasized the importance of the rising rate of relative uh, exploitation, which is the perpetuum, perpetuum gesetz, as Marx would put, uh, put it, the uh, building up of value and um, accumulation through monopoly, which is a contribution specific to Kaletsky. Is this uh, reading of the Kaletsky's position as a Marxian thinker uh, reasonable? Peter? Which Peter? <laughs> no, um, the not Peter Jones. Not Peter Jones. So I'm not quite clear what exactly you're asking. I'm asking that uh, is the view that Koletsky has about the falling rate of profit readable from his published work? Like, did he accept or did he criticize? Because some people say Koletsky wasn't a Marxist, but was a Marxian, because he didn't accept or criticize the, the tendency of falling rate of profit in the Marxian version of it. There may be various other versions. On the other hand, he emphasized on the rising rate of exploitation and relative uh, exploitation because he uh, divided the economy in two sections, which we, then we see also in Minsky, the uh, productive section and the less productive uh, section of uh, sector of the economy, the production of means of uh, production and the produ pro production of consumption goods. Um, so, yeah, my question is, is this reading reasonable? Is this reading that Kaletsky didn't like the falling rate of profit? And that's why some people excluded him from being a Marxist. I guess there are two parts of that. The first is, is a falling rate of profit necessary to be a Marxist? And I think if that's the case, Marx wasn't a Marxist. Because if you read his work on the falling rate of profit, um, it's, he believed, because most classical economists at the time believed, that it was one of those stylized facts that you have to explain. But when you look at the countervailing tendencies that he talks about, they totally dominate it. The second question is, did, was there a falling rate of profit in Kaleski? And for Kaleski, you know, there is a strong tendency towards stagnation of capitalist economies. And that tendency towards stagnation is, is caused by profits falling. And profits are falling partly because of the problems with investment that he talks about. Remember that for Kaleski, total investment is determined by capitalist investment decisions. And what happens is that because of the dialectical problem of, uh, of investment, that in the short run, it increases effective demand. In the long run, it increases capacity and makes the, the problem of effective <laughs> demand greater. Then that by itself, without any outside source of effective demand, will lead to falling profits and stagnation. But I'm not yeah, yeah, but sure also, that that makes him a Marxist. Well, I mean, if you look, there is this, this uh, little uh, <clears throat> brochure booklet, small booklet published by Paul Sweezy and um, in Monthly Review Press, <clears throat> which reproduces a, 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 a writing by Hilferding called, called the Marx and, and, and the close of his system, which is a sort of a reply uh, to, to Bombe, to Bemba Werk, right? But then if you look at Hilferding, does finance capital, there is not much story, there is not much use of the labor theory of profit in, 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 in all its, um, of the labor theory of value in, in all its forms. So, um, it, Kaletsky did not address this issue. It, it was not only once that appears in, in a paper in the, I think, in Oxford Economic Papers about the about post-war reconstruction, actually, about the possibility of a falling rate of tendency of uh, the rate of profit. But then he never comes back to it, you know? So he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't uh, particularly impressed by that, by, by that approach. In fact, may I say another thing, I bring in, in 1932, there was another paper by Kaletsky, which is not an academic, is not in, in, the, in the standard academic publication, still in the, in the Socialist Review in Poland, 
in which he criticizes he criticizes the chief uh, thinker, economic thinker. He was actually the the, the think the economic thinker of Stalin, of Stalin, called Eugene uh, Evgeny because he was Hungarian by origin and then moved to Russia. Uh, uh, um, Eugene Varga, hmm? and Eugene Varga argued that with the crisis of the 1930s, the Great Depression, <clears throat> there will be a capitalist recovery because he argued that the element of constant capital would, uh, uh, were going to be devalued as a result of the falling prices. And uh, this will reduce, therefore, the organic composition of capital. The organic composition of capital will fall. The rate of profit will pick up. And this is how the there will be the recovery from the crisis. That's what, and Kaleski criticized that and said, no, no, this is not true. It won't happen that way because the, 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 it, there will not be the falling prices of capital will be also be accompanied by the falling prices of, of total output. And therefore the composition of capital, the, the value composition of capital will not change. And anyway, without the dynamic of demand, you will not be restarting the process of capital accumulation. It will not restart endogenously. This is the very important. So he, he introduces a further critical element. It's a direct polemic with Varga, okay, about that. And and and, and it, it 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 shows that he was not taken in by that those stories of falling rate of profit or even rising rate of profit as a result of endogenous of endogenous processes. So, so to speak, my reading is right that Kalevsky, like Rosa Luxemburg, didn't really like the falling rate of tendency to fall at the rate of profit. And that paper may be a uh, quote to uh, reason about this. But also, in, in, the case, in, 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 in the case of Kalevsky, it's, it's understandable because he if the rate of profit may fall on account of increased unused capacity, for instance, okay? If, if, if capacity, and an, an unutilized capacity rises, obviously the rate of profit falls, right? Okay. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Lien Usher has raised the hand. So, your question, Lien, please. Yes, um, I was wanting to ask a question about um, to Peter about the the as as you enter that more advanced stage of capitalism and there's this decline in investment. Um, can, would you tie that directly to share buybacks by firms and pulling out capital from firms? Say it again. Sorry to so, ask you. Yeah. So yeah. with the with the connection between this transformation of capitalism and moving yeah. to the more developed period where firms are have a tendency to reduce the amount of investment would that mm -hmm. be connected it sounds to me very similar to the share buybacks of firms where rather than investing their um, hoarding cash and because of low interest rates, refinancing and paying back shareholders and basically just making the firm into a kind of skeleton rather than actually advancing in investment and, and investing capital. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what you're capturing there is the way capitalism has developed since Kaleski was writing, because of course, you know, it, it further evolves and develops. And I think the, the main change, what Kaleski didn't really analyze very much, but people like Minsky did, was the financialization of capitalism. And I think that's, I mean, I, I won't say it's missing because capitalism wasn't, uh, the financial sector wasn't as developed or as important when Kaleski was writing. But I certainly think that those developments, and particularly you know, along the lines you're suggesting, lead to further problems with investment and effective demand. And they're also the reasons why even the mainstream are now talking about secular stagnation. I mean, they're suddenly realising that you know, investment simply isn't there. Um, whereas for a long time, you know, in neoclassical theory, it would always rise because as long as we had enough savings. So I think that financialization leads to further problems, particularly with 
uh, the nature of investment and investment in real productive capacity. Yeah, on this issue, we need fresh thinking. We cannot just say, you know, go back and, and, and look. I mean, it may be interesting to look if the issue was raised, uh, but, but it, it was not because it was not of the proportions that in which it is today. So you need, uh, or in the last 20 years, you, you, need, uh, you need fresh thinking here. And it reminds me of Ed Nell's transformational growth and how the next, you know, that the, the one stage leads to the next stage um, where he, he gives a presentation from the craft economies on, you know. On yeah. Here. Yeah. Definitely. So from monopoly capital, the development of this system of hypertrophic finance, that's right because you need a system of monopoly capital to do that. You know, the small individualistic firm cannot really do that, except grab the money and run and, and then close down, yeah. As I said, also leads to changes in the dialectics of the system yeah. and the nature of class struggle, because you know, a lot of the struggle now is between industrial and financial capital, so that it changes you know, a lot of the, the nature of the class struggle that both Marx and Kaliska were writing about. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Once again, Zoom says my network bandwidth is low, so I hope I, you can hear me. Uh, there was a question in the chat from David Fields, but I would like to invite him to, to ask the question. So David, please, you, you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question if you want. Great, thanks a lot. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. excellent, okay. So this is to Peter and Joseph, and this is going back to the question on whether or not Kolesky fits within the Marxist tradition. And uh, would you agree that given the extent to which that Kolesky wrote about how the purpose of the class struggle is to destroy capital's lever, which is the reserve army of labor, would you, would you um, suggest or would you argue that this is a clear indication that Kolesky falls within the Marxist tradition? And my second question relates to the falling rate of profit. Uh, there's been a recent debate between uh, Michael Heinrich and um, Carcetti, and I think Kleiman was involved too, that uh, where Heinrich argues that, well, the falling rate of profit, as, um, as he noted in the, and I think it was Engels' drafts, I'm not sure where he, uh, he got the source, but at any rate, um, he argues that Marx is, um, when dealing with the rate of profit can be indeterminate. And since it can be indeterminate based on given conditions, it's more or less an empirical question. So since it's more or less an empirical question where it can be either determinate or indeterminate, um, you know, how holding on to a falling rate of profit as a necessary condition, it can be problematic. Um, I wanna know what your thoughts on that. So again, the first question is, uh, the reserve of labor is a clear indication that Kl Mark, that Kletsky fits within the uh, Marxist tradition. And the second question uh, on Heinrich's no notion that the falling rate of profit is more or less an empirical question, so it's not necessary a necessary condition to be, in fact, Marxist. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Okay. On, on the first question, I think you're, you're right. I think the, the, the political aspects of full employment paper is very much in the Marxist tradition. The idea that, you know, you can't get rid of unemployment. And he says very clearly that there's a difference between getting to full employment and staying there. And unless the institutions of capitalism change and develop, we will not be able to maintain full employment simply because of class interest. And I think that's very strongly in the Marxist tradition. On the second point on the, the rate of profit, there are some fundamental differences. I mean, one of the things is, of course, in, in Marx and the classical economists, they talk about a uniform rate of profit and the tendency towards a uniform rate of profit. Whereas in Kolesky's work, because of monopoly capitalism, because of barriers to entry, large corporation, there's no such tendency. And so it becomes difficult to talk about a general rate of profit uh, as being operationally meaningful in a macro sense. What Kolesky talks about more is total profits rather than the rate of profits. And given the total profits that are dependent on capitalist expenditure decisions, what will happen is that for any given uh, economy in the short run where the capital stock is given, 
uh, if they spend more and total profits increase, the rate of profit will go up and vice versa. So that the rate of profits is becomes the result of their macroeconomic activity. Um, it clearly has some influence on investment, and that's important. But in the but recall that Koleski believes that there's strong endogenous stagnationary tendencies that we need exogenous shocks, technological shocks, and other shocks to break out of. So I, I don't think he specifically discusses the falling rate of profit because the falling rate of profit, as I said, the rate of profit comes out of the macro decisions of business, of capitalists. That's interesting. Thanks for that. And because of that indication, would you suggest that or would you agree with the notion that the rate of profit, just as it as it stands, not not necessarily having a general tendency to fall, but given a, an analysis of total profits, which relates to the rate of profits, uh, as a measure of the health of the capitalist economy, which Marx argues, can be can more or less show that there that Kolesky also again fits within the Marxist tradition. I'm not sure. If, I mean, I think for Kolesky, the the measure of the health of the economy is the level of employment and growth. And it yeah. Rather but than that rate correlates to rate of profits in a sense. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Okay. <laughs> Joseph, do you... No, I don't, I don't have, I don't have to add. The only thing on the, on, on the reserve army of labor, what is important to understand is that in, 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 but also in Schumpeter, in Marx, but Schumpeter took it from Marx. As Bob Rothen once told me here in Sydney, is that Schumpeter is a, is a variant of Marx for the Americans because he puts this emphasis on the role of the entrepreneur and the innovations, etc. A conservative so, Marxist. <laughs> yeah. John Robinson said that Schumpeter was Marx, but with all the adjectives uh, the other way around. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I think the, the, the reserve army of the Marx is the, the, first, the first one who really talks about un, unemployment in clear analytical terms. And unemployment is functionally related to capital accumulation, okay? So when capital accumulation reaches its peak, while well, there is an increase in wages, it squeezes profit, out the, the trade cycle turns in, in the negative way and the creation of the reserve army of labor enables the wage rate to fall and the rate of profit to pick up again and accumulation starts all over again. So that is, it's, it's completely in, internal to the cycle process, right? Now, in, in the case of Kaletsky, the reserve army of labor operates when workers if, if full employment, he says it in the political aspect of full employment, that when full employment is reached, then people of the sound, sound finance uh, uh, managers worry about deficits. Yeah, start worrying about all these things, and they call, and, 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 and they start calling for cutting down on on expenditure, investment, and, and, and generates. But this is a way to discipline workers because when workers get to to full employment, while well, they, they they are more empowered, then they can in, increase whatever wages demand, new conditions, and so forth, and and therefore this has to be curtailed. So it's a more conscious action to recreate. Like, like remember Greenspan? Greenspan actually stated it that that, that workers should be living in permanent fears. Remember that in, in not just being stable at the low level, but they should actually be always sort of prompted to fear uh, a possible uh, worsening of their uh, condition of the employment prospect and so forth. So it's, it's a very, it becomes conscious in, in, in the case of Kaletsky, but as in Mars, it's not. In Mars, it's, it's an, a completely objective process, right? It's not mm -hmm. mediated by, by the political aspect. But as in Kaletsky, yes, it's the reserve army of labor is, is, is politically connected. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's go to the last question by Jonathan. He wrote it at the chat, but I will read it for you. So his question is, where would Kaletsky fall in the modern progressive movement toward democratic markets? For instance, worker co-ops functioning with capital markets. 
Well, I, I can give you. I mean, I, I, that's a. I, I think he would. He would. He, he would. He was not a social democrat. Okay, he was not a social democrat. Uh, in Poland, he was never a member of the Communist Party, but he always argued. He argued for for central planning, and in fact, there is a paper by Kalecki on when when Gomulka introduced the came to power. They introduced workers uh, workers. Um, committees in the factories, right? And uh, and he, he, he said that's all, all, all right to introduce these sort of committees in the factories for democratic purposes, but it's not so all right to introduce them for economic reasons, because if you give autonomy, cooperative type of autonomy to factories, they will form imperfectly competitive system. They will they will find markets in which they can fix prices, you know, become kind of local oligopolist and, and so forth. And that's not what we want. We don't want that. Since since he never he was never on the Lange side in terms of of markets being best competitive, perfectly competitive under socialism, right? He he never he never bought that that line and he was in favor of central planning. Therefore, I don't think he would be for cooperative working within capital markets because he knew that capital markets are not atomistic markets. And if, if they are atomistic, they are unreliable and they are not efficient. If they are, if they are big, they are part of monopoly capital, which is what they are, yeah. Okay, Peter, do you want to add? Uh, can I interrupt here? Yes. Yes. Well, um, in relation to the last question and reply, I think in the paper of 1956, uh, Workers, Central Planning and Workers' Councils, Kalecki was really more concerned with the question that if there is no central planning, but profit orientation at the enterprise level, this would result in increased unemployment. And for yeah. Kalecki, full employment was a guiding principle, whichever economic system he studied. So yes, Joseph is right in so far that some workers' councils could be rent seekers on individual markets. But first and foremost, Kalecki's concern was full employment. And I remember uh, having read uh, in minutes of one of the meetings of the special committee that, that discussed those issues, that Kalecki said that before and during the war in the West, they paid me for fighting for full employment. And here you want to pay me for generating full employment? No way. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. But also because there was the Yugoslav exp experience and the Yugoslav experience, Yugoslavia was not capable with the decentralization system that they had and the workers' cooperative. That's right, they were not reaching full employment. Peter, do you want to add something? No. Okay, so we are close to our, to our end in minutes. So uh, I will finish the, the session now. I would like to thank very much Peter Chrysler and Joseph Alevi, both of the Peter Chryslers who presented today for your <laughs> excellent presentations and everyone who asked questions, very good questions, and also everyone who attended. And I will just to say we have a 45 minutes break now and the next session starts at 1 p.m. New York time. It will be chaired by Lee and Usher. 
and it is entitled Kaletsky and Cambridge. The presenter is Maria Cristina Marcuso. So we have a, a break of 45 minutes so we can eat and etc. And I hope to see you back in 45 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>